Hello and welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining me today. There are a lot of trigger warnings that I'm going to lead with. If any of these feel like they may be too much, I invite you to not listen to this episode. We are talking today about many, many hard topics. We are talking about kidnapping, homicide, molestation, eating disorders, car accidents, sexual assault and trauma, adoption, suicide, and drunk driving. My guest today has overcome all of those, all of those things. And today, Deb Michael is over 100 days alcohol-free. She is a graduate of Project 90 and a member of our Beyond 90 program. This episode is an act of rebellion. It's Deb sharing her story. Some of the things, some some of these things she hasn't talked about in public before. Some of them she has. Except alcohol controlled her life in many ways for many years. And I'm really happy to have her here. As you listen to this, I invite you to not compare whatever you've been through to what Deb has survived. Trauma is trauma is trauma. And whatever you've been through in your life, whether you resonate with one, some, all of those those topics, your emotions are valid. You are worthy. And the overarching theme of today's episode is hope. There is healing possible. There is a life without alcohol possible. So Deb, congratulations on being over 100 days alcohol free. Thank you for being here. Um, Let's just get started with telling me, our listeners, um, just a little bit about your life now. Where do you live? What do you do? How many children? How long have you been married? Thanks, Victoria. Um, So I live in Casper, Wyoming. It's like the second largest town in Wyoming. Um, I think there's 60,000 people here. Um, I have five children and three grandchildren. Um, I've been married 30 years this November. Um, so I've lived uh, all around, but you know, I kind of ended up here. That's where my husband's from. Um, I run a mental health practice. I have about 24 employees. Um, I, um, yeah, I do it every day. I love it. Wonderful. That's what I do. Thank you. So, So, um, Deb and I talked about this and you know, these are such important topics and I'm going to go out on a limb and say that most of us have experienced at least one of these things. There is not enough time in the world to really do to do, to do justice for each of these experiences. And so what Deb and I have decided to do is, is go over each of these uh, in some sort of linear way that, that reflects the, the basic timeline of when they happened And Deb is going to give a little bit of context, uh, explain what happened, and how it made her feel, the messaging she received internally and externally during each of these events. Uh, Deb, 
so that our listeners can become a little more familiar with you, you talked about your wonderful family today, your uh, long marriage. Congratulations. Can you give us uh, some background on your family of origin and what growing up in that family was like? Absolutely. Thank you. So um, I grew up in a household, uh, there were six children. My mom and dad were married 49 years when my mom died. So they stayed married. Um, There were five girls and one boy and my mom had six children in about seven and a half years. So we were very, very close, um, to, you know, in age. Uh, my dad was a school teacher and a football coach initially um, when we were younger, and we, we were very poor. Mm-hmm. We didn't have anything. You know, my parents wrapped um, cans of food for Christmas, you know. So, um, you know, we were, you know, I guess social was, we knew what was required of us. My dad had some really high expectations. My dad's a very smart person, he speaks a number of languages, you know, so, uh, the best is it. And um, the pressure that was put on us at our home was terrible. And, you know, it was, um, if you're not bleeding, you're not, there's no reason to cry kind of thing at our house, you know, and, and we weren't heard for things that when we had needs, you know, our needs weren't important. It's interesting, though, because you, Mm. you only know what you know. So I, we just, you think it's normal. And I, I have a good relationship. Well, a good enough relationship with my dad now. And, you know, everyone, no one's perfect, but, um, you know, so lots and lots of pressure on all of us. Um, and very, very talented kids in this house. My dad knew that. And I think he pushed us for it. Um, but you know, yeah. So do you want me to elaborate I have on that? A question, or just wait? Um, based on what you've shared with me previously. So large family scarcity mm-hmm. of time, money, your mother's energy, I can't imagine, uh, and tremendous pressure. Mm -hmm. And uh, your feelings didn't really, really matter. You were expected to meet these expectations that were outlined by your father. Um, Tell me a little bit of, did I get that right? Does that summarize it? Okay. Yes, Um, absolutely. Tell me a little bit about your family of origins relationship with alcohol? Mm. So um, we were, I would consider Mm -hmm. very religious. You don't miss church, even if you're sick, you go. Um, And my dad, so my mom never drank alcohol ever in her life. And I believe that that's true. Um, And so my, my dad was a closet drinker. um, And so And my, my grandpa was an alcoholic. His father was a veteran and came home from the war. And we all knew grandpa, Mm. grandpa drank. And that's just how it was until he had a stroke. And then he forgot that he drank. That's interesting. Okay. And so alcohol Mm -hmm. was taboo and your father, it sounds like was mired in shame around his own maladaptive drinking. And so it was a known secret within your family. Hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, okay. it was. Mm-hmm. I can already see the trends emerging. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's amazing how things play out over years and decades. The, those things we learn at yeah. a young age, how they carry over. And, you know, yeah. I just want to also say, Deb, that uh, many, many of the members in our group and many of our listeners come from a background of, of some alcohol use disorder in the family. And I think it's, it's important just to note that you are a cycle breaker. Yeah. Yeah. Just Thank something you. to just tuck away for yourself. I like to look at it that yeah. way. So, uh, as I said, listeners, uh, I'm going to briefly touch on these things. And if you need to take a breath, Deb, you let me know. Listeners, if you need to take a breath, go ahead and do it. 
And I invite you to just, just hear Deb. And again, I thank you, Deb, for being so incredibly vulnerable with us. Um, let's start with the topic of kidnapping. Can you give us right. a little bit of that story? Absolutely. Um, so when I was about three years old, and this is really the first trauma I think I remember, but um, my we lived on an Indian, a Navajo Indian reservation. My dad ran a trading post about 100 miles south of Gallup. And um, the our home was located behind the trading post. And one night, one of the um, old men or Indian men came in through our window um, and he stole my sister from our bedroom. And um, so, you know, um, I have this memory and the memory is that I was not afraid for myself and I wasn't afraid for my sister. My fear was that I was going to have to go tell my father that she was gone. Mm -hmm. And I was three and she was two. Um, she was a year and 14 days younger than I was. And, um, so when I went to tell him my memory is that he looked at me and said, why did you let them take her? And so um, that was really difficult. We did get my sister back. They did. We ran the trading post. So the mm -hmm. Indians went and found her. Um, I don't really know what happened. And honestly, we've never really talked a lot about it. I, I, the memory that I have is all that I have to tell you guys. And then what they've talked about, you know, um, I've tried to bring it up a few times with my dad and not much is said, but I'm pretty sure the Indians mm -hmm. took care of that mm -hmm. man that took my sister. So, it, so of course, at such a young age. And the circumstances under which it occurred, you're, you're just a, a little, little, little girl. And this stranger comes mm -hmm. in, takes your sister. It makes sense that you wouldn't remember a whole lot of, the, of it, but isn't it interesting that you remember how you felt and that your reaction, Absolutely. your initial reaction, as you recall it, was being afraid to tell your dad. And in the decades that have followed, nobody talking about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, understandably, you mentioned that after that, well, it sounds like you, you don't remember a time when you didn't struggle with sleep. So. Yeah. There is not a time that I right in fact, right yeah. so uh, <laughs> there you are three years old your sister's back no one's talking about it and you can't sleep totally understandable yeah uh, that lack of sleeping does kind of lead us to number two which is homicide yeah. you shared that mm -hmm. as a little girl mm -hmm. now let me just mention that Deb and I and many of you listeners we did grew up in the 60s and 70s. It was a different era. Uh, we were less supervised. I do find this lack of supervision astounding. However, uh, kids did wander around on their own more back then. And this just sounds like a crazy story to me, but here we go. Um, talk to me about that night of riding your bike around your neighborhood. Okay. So I must have been seven or eight years old. I think I took, I think it was like 1982 or something like that. Anyway, it was a tiny little town, but, um, and we may have been sleeping in the tent outside. I don't know, but, um, I would ride my bike around occasionally. My dad was the football coach in this tiny little town, um, in Ashton, Idaho. So, um, I knew most of the football players and anyway, there was a girl that occasionally her light would be on and I would just swing by her window and um she knew my name you know she knew who I was and she was very kind anyway one night I had gone there and I I don't know that I went and talked to her that night but I had driven by I'd seen her um my fingerprints were on her window from some point in time but um as I was riding my bike away I did I heard a gunshot I don't I didn't know anything happened um and then anyway, she was shot in the head through her window that night. And um, 
So I heard about it. We told the police they came and did an interview with me. And um, this is one thing I thought about a little later that I would say to you. Um, my parents actually sent all of us children away for a little while that summer because somebody, my, it, word must have got out that hmm. I saw something and, um, and we weren't safe because somebody tried to get into our house. So I'm not really sure how much of that's true, but there was a lot of fear, you know? And then one thing that I remember thinking is not trusting myself that I was hmm. telling the truth or what, what, I, what, what my reality was the I real see. thing that happened because it was questioned. Okay. So here we have the theme of not talking about things, uh, sweeping things under the rug, and then you experience something that is extremely traumatic. And at that age, eight, nine years old, it's questionable if you're actually telling the truth. Yeah. And it wasn't that right, much that right. I'd seen. I wasn't telling them. I but you heard the killer. shot. You know, um, they asked me. I heard the shot, and actually, when they did find the man, the car that I described mm -hmm. was the car and that he owned. how many years later was that? And the color. Yeah. It was 24 years after, the, or 30. It was quite yeah, a while so after. 24 they, to 30 years killed. later, mm -hmm. come to find out that, oh, mm -hmm. little Deb was, was accurate the whole time. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I'm guessing you didn't sleep much after that either. No. And then the next topic, um, molestation. Yeah. Yeah. So um, shortly after that, um, and it must have been right after that summer, my mom and dad had a Navajo Indian girl that came and lived with us as an exchange student. And while she was at our house, she actually... Um, molested all of the children in the home. I think Emily, my youngest sister, might have been too young, but uh, I, well, who knows? But I know that she molested all of us. And um, my, so, but it was never talked about, never. Um, my, I never had a conversation. All of a sudden, Elizabeth was just gone from our house. And that, right. that was all. So again, going back to the theme of probably inadequate supervision, trauma, no discussion, no concern. Hey, what happened? Are you okay? You just woke up one day and went to breakfast and she wasn't there. And that was that. And no one talked about it. Had you learned at that point not mm -hmm. to really even ask? Yeah, no. Um, interesting, just as we're talking about that, there were two things that I, I, I thought might at least help a little. So we were taken, um, the Department of Family Services actually mm -hmm. took us from my mother twice for neglect. So they were aware that um, her children were a little unruly, maybe, or not a good supervision, you know, but we can say whatever. Um, but um, the other thing that I was... Um, oh, well, I lost my train of thought, but anyway, you were it, just saying that two, later, two but, things uh, that you recalled the fact that child services did get oh, involved and took you mm -hmm. twice. Mm -hmm. And the other was, um, one, one day my sister took me to, she was in kindergarten to show and tell. She walked all the way to school with me and, um, mind you, I must've been four years old and Jem was five or five and a half. And, um, my mom did not know I was gone until the school called her at lunchtime. Okay. Sorry. It was, so all my siblings were there with her. Nobody noticed that you were gone. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, you don't need to say sorry. Yep. Feeling emotions, not here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. It's a rough one. Is this, um, since you've become alcohol free, just a little side here, since you've become alcohol free, do you find yourself experiencing and, and 
emoting more? Are you, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, a little more, I'm, I, mm -hmm. I'm a lot more emotional, yeah. People and survivors of trauma can often, especially when they're using substances or other maladaptive coping mechan mechanisms, can get to the point where they're so dissociated that they simply tell their story like a robot. Just, yep, this happened and then this happened and then this happened. And yeah, so here I am. Good thing I'm strong, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I get it. I get it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so... We're going to talk, uh, obviously, more about your drinking and the progression of it and when it was introduced and stuff like that. But for the purpose, again, of just getting through these, through, not getting through, but honoring these experiences, um, we're not going to quite talk about when it was introduced. But I do want to introduce, speaking of maladaptive coping mechanisms, uh, your experience with the next item, which is eating disorders. Can you touch on that mm -hmm. for us? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I have all my life struggled with, um, anorexia, bulimia, um, binging, purging, things like that. Um, I actually, you know, did a lot of therapy for that. Um, probably started to rear its ugly head that I really knew when I was about 11 or 12 years old. Um, it, there were though, because scarcity at our house, you know, I do remember being, I actually was spanked mm. for drinking milk one day, you know, cause okay. it was the baby's milk. So, um, and mm -hmm. we knew that mm -hmm. it was for her. And so, um, you know, that was, that was difficult, but I, so I do think, you know, there were some things there, but I think, uh, you know, um, I wasn't given tools at a young age to, um, to know even healthy, uh, healthy eating. You just, you just tended to yourself and you made things work. Um, I mean, my mom would try and feed us, but you know, so, uh, I didn't know how to even mm -hmm. manage food. I didn't know. I didn't know it, you know, it, what was nutritious, what wasn't, you know, none of that was taught to us. But secondly, um, it was, it was something that was uh -huh. special. Uh -huh. And so mm. it was a reward. And um, I think that's kind of where it started for me. And then, you know, not knowing how to control it, you know, and so just really, really struggled with that all, all my life, you know, because when you have such a severe eating disorder for so long, um, you, every day is you know, mm -hmm. it's almost like an addiction, and, but mm -hmm. that was how I coped, you know, um, you get the endorphins and I'm sure, you know, you, you know, that from, um, purging mm -hmm. or things like that. And so, um, but uh, you try to gain a sense oh, of control sure. with yeah. the food. And it's, it's not like an addiction. It is a, a form of process addiction, um, and same, yeah. same pathways. And that's why I asked, you know, when you remember, um, I, I thankfully didn't experience that kind of food scarcity, but I know people who have, and food is a reward. You don't know how much you'll get or when you'll get it again. And so naturally you want to get as much as you can. Um, you can be punished for taking what's deemed too much. And so I can already, and then of course, without understanding or, or being fed, balanced, nutritious meals, that's creating all sorts of chaos in your young mind. And so it, I can see how your mm -hmm. relationship with food would have been skewed from the beginning. And then, uh, yeah, you get into things. And, and, and this is something that, that I can understand. And some people look at, they, they simply can't understand eating disorders, but what you touched on is so important because it is about the thrill of control. It's the thrill of delayed gratification. 
the thrill mm-hmm. of external, hopefully, validation, mm-hmm. the release, it's mm-hmm. all those things. And yeah. that goes that goes for individuals suffering with overeating and and obesity and morbid obesity. It's fascinating to see how similar the brain looks when it is in the cycle of any of these things, whether it's a substance, a process, um, gambling, all the things. The brain lights up in the same ways and has the darkness in the same areas. It's really, it really is something. So thanks for sharing that. And again, we're talking about, you know... <laughs> How the, how the pump was primed for you. Um, and so if it mm-hmm. wasn't alcohol, it was something else. And it just, it, it makes a lot of sense. And we'll get to, to that. And, and again, I'm sh- you're sharing, you're doing so beautifully sharing about how it made you feel. And that's so, Thanks. yeah, you're so worthy of being heard on how it made you feel. So thank you. Thank you, Victoria. The next item was your car accident with your mom. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So when I was 16 years old, um, my mother, we were, we all, we were run off the road or uh, by someone who had been drinking, um, which we actually really didn't blame it on them, but just a side note there, but um, anyway, it's, you know, on I-80, the three sisters, anyone who's driven over there would know. But um, my mom, the car rolled, you know, six mm-hmm. or seven, five or six times. And when they found my sister and my mom were in the car, my sister was trapped under the car, but they actually didn't even know there was a third person in the vehicle for quite some time. And when they found me, I was not alive. Um, I, um, they revived me and they put me on a stretcher and I, I died three different times within the next 24 hours. One of them, I was almost dead for seven minutes. How old were you? 16. I was 16. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just turned 16 in December and it was, I think it was Valentine's Mm -hmm. day that year. So 1991. Um, yeah. So but when they found me, um, they put me on, they actually hung me at the top of the, um, the ambulance because my sister was injured where she had to have 300 stitches put in her head and her brain was exposed. And so she'd lost units of blood. And so, um, they hung me there and then, you know, and the next time that I actually, they found me and had to revive me is they'd left me in the ambulance while they were taking care of her and trying to save her life. So, um, and they did not leave anyone in there with me, I'm telling you, (laughs) but, um, yeah, interestingly, and I, they just a small, you know, hospital, I think they were just really working at saving her life. They weren't as concerned for me. So, um, I broke my back in 12 places, um, compression fractures, transverse process fractures, um, Mm -hmm. broken ribs. And so they put me in a body cast Mm -hmm. for quite some time. Um, I know that those those medical workers were probably doing the best they could and they're not, they weren't consciously saying, you know, Deb doesn't matter as much as the other people who are injured. Uh, they have to triage, right? And I'm, I'm sure none of all, they only meant to do good and, and help, help you. However, the irony of, of that whole story is not lost. So, oh, mm-hmm. Deb was in the car, didn't even realize there was another person in the car. This person needs <laughs> more help than, than Deb does. And again, I'm not saying that wasn't true, given I'm not a medical professional. I don't know how they determined that. Um, and I'm really grateful they were able to save you. However, again, you know, then you were left in the ambulance without supervision because they needed to save your sister. And I'm glad they did. But see it again, it's like 
those things, when it comes down to emotions, my guess is, Deb, that in your head, you could rationalize that, kind of like what I just did. Like, okay, I, that yeah. does make sense. And how did it feel to you? Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting. Now I notice then I that just felt normal. like that was normal. That they would mm -hmm. take care of someone else mm -hmm. before me. And I'm not, I'm it, it, you can hear the emotion from me, but I, um, now that I think about it, I think I'm sure that sent a message to myself and That's I didn't exactly even it. realize it. Right. Right. My, I mean, by 16, my gosh, you had clearly received the message that your feelings didn't matter. Don't talk about your feelings. Um, and so I could see how that would just be par for the course. Yeah. yeah. Something else. Now, um, again, we'll touch on the alcohol progression and things like that later. Uh, but by this time, alcohol was a part of your life. And um, that mm -hmm. that's important to know as we talk about the sexual trauma. Uh, so that just just so that uh, our listeners don't don't make any assumptions such as this was this was the first time you'd ever tried alcohol or something like that. And there's no judgment mm -hmm. around it at all. I'm just doing it for context. Um, so uh, yes. sexual trauma. Um, anything you would like to share around that? Well, actually, and I will share. I actually have I not drank had. yet. So right after that, I, I, I was, I don't think so. Um, they gave me a morphine drip. I actually started thinking about this. I think the trigger for me was the feeling oh. from that. So I had a little button I pushed and I could, they timed it. And I actually remember, I didn't share this with you, but after we talked, I thought, gosh, I was trying to put the time frame together. And I'm pretty sure it was that oh. summer that I, because I was a sophomore in high school that year. And that was the summer that I started drinking. And interestingly enough, I... So I, I remember sometimes pushing that all three times and knowing that wow. I have to wait an hour. Oh, okay. Hey, well, thanks for that. correcting me. Well, it's I just think interesting. that's interesting, you know? Yeah. Because, because we've got, again, mm -hmm. we've got the emotional part, we've got the trauma part. And now, so I thought the yeah. substance that was first introduced was the alcohol and boy, oh boy. Well, doesn't that makes sense so you were in a body cast so of course you were given pain medication and you loved that feeling yeah well wh who wouldn't want to escape a body cast how awful for you i'm so sorry mm -hmm. and yeah bring on the morphine yeah just push the button so um and i don't think i i think i had told you but the more i thought about it i'm sure now that i think about it and i actually didn't make that connection until mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. we talked the other day interesting okay so that was yeah. so then that summer is when i started drinking um and i you know off and on and i actually remember i drank black velvet the first time i drank and i did not get drunk really now is black velvet is that a whiskey yeah so it is it's a whiskey uh -huh. and i don't know how but much you didn't get you didn't get high from it but mm -mm, i didn't but i started drinking after that quite a bit and that just leads to you know um i got drunk at a party and someone gave me some spanish fly i was very irresponsible with the drinking because it hadn't been taught in my house and i mean it was voodoo mm -hmm. you just didn't know anything about it but i think kids are anyway but i just feel like that's maybe the excuse i would tell myself but I, you know, so I lost my virginity, you know, due to that Spanish fly. And so then it was just, I, I just kind of lost all ki kinds of control. Um, I shared with you, you know, um, just Makey really had no control and, and no thought processes associated with the alcohol. I just mm -hmm. wanted to get drunk mm -hmm. all the time. And, um, one night, and it was a school night, like a Wednesday night, I went out to go to a party with a... Um, just a local place where a lot of people hung out 
an older person let a lot of younger people wonder oh, what they were thinking right come to their house and get drunk now that you think about it you're like yeah i wonder um and i i um that night they were making us screwdrivers in a blender and i don't even know mm -hmm. what i had but i drank a lot a lot a lot and um probably smoked some marijuana to, you know but um i was assaulted by a number of different people that night quite a few and um mm -hmm. don't remember any of it and then my sister came and she basically saved my life that next morning um i didn't show up to school and she's like i didn't come home that night and so she knew where i was and she came and found me in a room where it, it was just mm -hmm. a terrible sight she told me about and so i went home and um my dad actually i didn't tell you this gave me an iv he was an ambulance worker um, they did that on the side to get extra money. And he actually gave me an IV because I was so sick. But I, um, you know, not only was I physically ill, I, I was, my, my spirit broken. was broken yeah. and it was sick. Um, I, so, you know, I went to school and I actually didn't know what had happened, but people there did. <sighs> and um, so, you know, they, they all had yes. their opinions and they said things and that was really hard. Um, and I'm pretty sure, I think I shared this with you, that um, my dad, being a teacher and a football coach there, heard about it, and he never said anything, mm -hmm. and he never mm -hmm. stuck up for me. Um, and that was hard, mm -hmm. but it was never talked about. Never, never, talked, never about. talked about. And so mm -hmm. when, you, when you started drinking, you said you right away, and, and this does happen to some people, right? Some people, it's a very slow progression. Other people get a taste of it and, and you got a taste of the morphine and you wanted more and more and more. And then you started with alcohol and it was no slow progression. You just wanted to get drunk. And so what do you yeah. remember alcohol providing for you? Oh uh, yeah. It provided me, well, it took all responsibility mm -hmm. away from me. I, I didn't have to be accountable in my mind. And clearly I wasn't at all. And mm. it was an escape. It, it was an escape we, for me. Yeah. An from escape from life. your own life. And then you have this yeah. un horrifically awful thing happen to you by not one, but many monsters. Mm -hmm. Your sister comes yeah. and saves you. You're certain that your father has heard about it. He gives you an IV because you're physically ill. The rumor mill starts. I mean, boy, we think things are tough for women today around sexual assault. Back then, it was, oh, it just, it was bad. I think it happened to more women than it didn't at least the women that I, that I knew, I mean, it just seemed to happen to all of us to some extent. And you got, you got really r just violated on every single level by many people. And then your father wasn't there to protect you. So you were already using alcohol to escape. And you just said yeah. that your spirit broke. Uh, yeah, and it did. And so, did your drinking accelerate after that? It did. It got really, really bad. Um, I would drink. I actually got caught drinking at school, and the principal, Mr. Hicks, was so nice. Um, he um, called me in and just sent me home. So, but, you were drinking at um, school? You know. The, okay. I did sometimes, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even at school. Um, I was always bored at school anyway. So, but uh, yeah, I was. I was even, I started drinking at school even then because, you know, I'd come around the corner and people would make a train <gasps> sound to me oh, or damn. it was pretty bad. My gosh. Yeah. So, you know, that really was an escape for me.
Yeah. Yeah. And in a town our size, you know, I mean, the school yeah. had 400 kids in it. Yeah. It's just so. Yeah. 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 I can see how mm -hmm. alcohol would have would have filled up many, many empty places in your life. Yeah. It was my only, only friend. friend. Mm hmm. Um, so now we talk about your first daughter. Mm. Yes. Um, I, you know, and I got to own all well, my own behaviors. Well, okay. <laughs> yes. Look, there's, there's yes. owning our own behaviors. And then there is, mm -hmm. and we talk about this in the program, Deb, about if this, if this yes. were my story. And I said, oh, well, Deb, I got to own my part. We're talking about a 16, 17-year-old girl, right? I mean, right. really? Would you say, yeah, Victoria, own your part? <laughs> right? No. I, I'd be like, yeah. So no, let's just thank you for a little that. mini coaching yeah. tip here. Um, those default patterns, they come out, right? And so, you know, I mean, goodness. I, I, yeah, yeah. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And so, you know, you start looking for any kind of, and clearly I wasn't, my emotions weren't being at anywhere. And so, you know, no wonder I had all sexual behaviors as well, well, you know. My goodness. Can we just mm -hmm. say it in case in 2024, almost 2025, that number one, mm -hmm. women are allowed to do what they want to do sexually and also mm -hmm. young girls who are promiscuous or very sexually active i don't even use the word promiscuous who are very sexually active it's unlikely they're doing it for the you know to have their belt to have to have those <laughs> yeah. the bell rung right it, Yes, we right. Know this. We know, this. and so yeah. yeah. So let's just again. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. Any any girl yeah. who has yeah. who has experienced that, you know, hopefully she gets to a point where she can she can look at herself with compassion, and um, that's certainly how I look at you, Deb. Yeah. So okay. So what Thank happened? You. So my. So let's see, my junior year, I was at a graduation party and got really, really drunk and um, got pregnant. And so um, uh, my, I knew, you know, my family had made it very clear that if ever we got in trouble like that, um, we would be putting the okay. baby up for adoption. And um, so I did not tell anyone that I was pregnant until Thanksgiving. In fact, it was two days before Thanksgiving that year, and my daughter was born well, February sixth. So, so I was so you seven waited months seven pregnant months to tell mm -hmm. anyone in your family, and nobody noticed. No, not really. I was a pretty small person, and I mean, I had gained weight. I think some. My sister actually, we were laughing about this the other day. Called me fat, and I think I beat her up over it. I was so mad. <laughs> and hormonal oh and nobody goodness. knew yeah. Emily my youngest yeah. she's like Deb I think you beat me mm -hmm. up I was like yeah I was mad um, no emo emotional re like regulation at all but you know and so um, you know my dad and mom were actually nice about it they weren't mean but my dad just said you need you know what you need to the first thing he said was I'm mm -hmm. sorry this happened to you and then he said um, you know what you need to do Okay. You need to give the baby away. And so they flew me to um, Bellevue, Washington, where I lived with my uncle um, until she was born. That's where I put her up for adoption and a closed adoption. I signed um, the adoption papers on my 18th birthday. And um, I spent three days in the hospital with her. And then I didn't see her again until mm -hmm. she was 19. So um, that was really hard. And um, I was angry for a long time, but, you know, I stayed sober when I found out I was pregnant. I was able to do that because, um, well, the theme of my life is that other things mm -hmm, matter than, mm -hmm. more than I do. 
That is so, remarkable, um, though. Given given the the trauma that you had been through, the amount of self medication that you'd been, you know, the way that you've been using that you had been using alcohol, and then which of course led to the disease of alcohol use disorder, and so um, it, it it is remarkable that you were able to not drink during those those months. That's that's actually astounding given every, and the, and again, back to the secrets and I don't matter and I don't have anyone to look out for me here and the shame, right? Because of what had happened to you in which you had no participation um, or, or consent. And, you know, you, you, you had been bullied and mocked and had not, not experienced any caring or compassion from a single person and then and then you end up pregnant which i can only imagine what messaging that reinforced in you and so let's not minimize that right like that's a big deal that you didn't drink when you were pregnant and i'm so glad for you that that at least you know at least yeah. that and and so your daughter was adopted and uh we'll get to that part later yeah. You you do light yeah. up with a smile yeah. when you talk about her. I, I, that's that's really special. Yeah. That that was the hardest yeah. thing in my life I ever did. Yeah. Lots of pride there. Mm. Yes. Yeah, that is a very so very very brave and, and difficult yeah. thing. So. For our listeners, I mean, gosh, I hope that someday each and every person listening to this will be able to, and remember, Deb is, is just over 100 days alcohol-free, which is a humongous milestone. And what we know about the brain and how it heals from alcohol use disorder, physiologically, she's she's beginning to heal right there's been some really good progress and at a, at just over 100 days she can see you can hear her have some self compassion for the version of herself that went through all of those things and guys you know there's tons more right this is we had to make it into an episode like we can't share all the things but can you imagine and so you know what what I love so much about Deb is that I love a lot of things about Deb but what I love is that mm -hmm. you're showing glimmers of self-compassion mm -hmm. glimmer glimmers of self Thank you. love when you came in when Deb came into this program one of the first things I noticed about her, you, Deb, it was your, was your commitment. You were like, I'm here, I'm doing this. Your vulnerability and the way that you so easily had compassion for others, right? And so when I start to see little glimmers of self-compassion, self-love, the kind that comes so naturally to you in every other area, except when it comes to you. To me, that's just, that's just cause for a ticker take, tick take parade, really. It's such a big deal. So I just, again, yeah. want to pause and just acknowledge you for that. It's, it's huge. And so, you know, my hope for our listeners is that someday you, you get to where Deb is not just in your alcohol-free day count, but, but that by leaning into this methodology and this process that you, the healing, the physiological healing begins and a lot of the emotional healing. And, you know, Deb, you've shared that you have had therapists and, and done EMDR and things like that. But isn't it interesting when the alcohol is removed how the the needle does start to move in a different way like huh yeah it's huge 
it can you it, speak to that a little huge. bit what that's been like for you yeah oh just honestly i can't i can't believe how easy it has been it feels not mm-hmm. easy but hard and easy but just have the way the program is but i had tried everything i mean i had lost hope and so anyway what i have seen is um i appreciate you know, my ability to give myself grace in some areas, um, has happened more. Um, and I'm, it's almost like the fog has Mm kind of gone away and, um, the, the, um, the winds are noticed more and, um, and welcomed more and, um, and I'm honest with myself. Wow. That's, that's beautiful. Yeah. So, you know, guys, if you're struggling with, with drinking and, and you recognize that you've got some darn good reasons that you drank, you know, I mean, if you heard Deb's story, you'd go, well, geez, no wonder she drank. Well, guess what? Your trauma is just as real. And when you get to the other side of alcohol, meaning you've given, gotten some time and your brain's cleared out, like Deb said, the fog starts to clear and lift, you know, it's going to make sense why you did that. Maybe there's, maybe the self-loathing and, and the disgust and the shame. What if that just started to move out of the way and in its place came some understanding, right? We, I know I struggled. That was such a big thing for me was the self-loathing and everything else and just I didn't and and now I can look back and say my trauma was my trauma it wasn't like Deb's trauma it was a different trauma and it doesn't make mine any less real any less impactful Um, and so I can look back at that version of me who kept turning to the bottle time and time and time and time again and say, I understand why you did that. And I understand how addiction crept in and got its claws in you. And I can say to myself, Victoria, I'm really glad you got out when you did. Right? Does that resonate, Deb? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, you know, I'm kind of going off on a little sidebar here, but I just think it's important for people to understand that that everything we've been through, um, it doesn't have to be this laundry list um, of, of, oh my gosh, how does one person endure that, right? It's, it, it's just your experience. And yours is remarkably large and long. And, you know, it, it's, I mean, I'm just humbled that I get to talk with you about it and, just hold space for you. And I feel like, you know, a lot of this you haven't shared in P90. Um, As I've said, you know, P90 is about the alcohol. And then in B90, we start to become more connected, share more of our story and things like that. But um, what has it felt like to feel safe? in this program. Oh, that, that has been huge for me. And I cannot, I know I've mentioned it a lot of times to you and also to the po- pods every time. I just want to tell them, um, you know, I, this, that mm-hmm. was the biggest thing for me was to know that I was safe and wouldn't be judged and um, was given that space to just share my story because I haven't been able mm-hmm. to ever. Mm-hmm. In my life. Yeah. It's an honor. And you've heard, you've heard some of people's Thanks. stories and isn't it an honor to, to, to know that for each person, it, it really is that, um, it's, it's that sigh of relief that they are finally safe to talk about their drinking and to yeah. say what they need to say. Mm-hmm. And I honor every experience of anyone's because I know it just makes us stronger. Yes. 
Yeah. And sometimes Miss Strong Deb. <laughs> and this is something I learned on my... Ah! Sorry, having a glitch. Mm -hmm. One second. Got Well, I'm glad it's you and not me, Victoria. <laughs> Something I learned on my path to becoming alcohol free is that us super strong ones are allowed to break. <laughs> and yeah. I look at you and I see someone beautifully broken, just like I see myself. Beautifully, beautifully broken. Thank you. I'm I would own glad that. you're owning that. And so, mm -hmm. you know, again, for our listeners, we could go on and on about each, each of these topics. And we're touching here on hope. And so, Deb, tell me a little bit about your siblings. And then we're gonna move into your life today. So. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, like I told you, and um, I guess, you know, this is mm -hmm. where I'm so grateful for just whatever, wherever my road led me, there was something there that Mm -hmm. that saved me or something. Um, so I, you know, told you guys that I grew up in a house where um, lots of talent, you know, and, and I actually, this is more of a theme. I always just felt like I didn't belong because my oldest sister, um, and mm -hmm. she was a genius. She is, well, she's a genius. Um, she was girl state governor here in the state of Wyoming saying for Dick Cheney when he mm. was the governor and then he actually pardoned her first mm. felony, I believe, um, or something mm -hmm. like that. I don't really know. But um, so I had my oldest sister, Jen, and then, um, you know, my brother, who was an All-American football player, had, you know, he was a great football player, top 25 in the state of Wyoming. Mm -hmm. You know, they have all of those accolades. And then my youngest sister was actually invited to be on the first women's national wrestling team. So mm -hmm. lots of talent at our house. I mean, mm -hmm. clearly we were pushed. Uh, you know, I got a full ride scholarship out of high school, mm -hmm. which I drank out myself out of. But, <laughs> you know, we all have these things. But, um, you know, I look at and this is actually how I look at it. We grew mm -hmm. up in a pressure mm -hmm. cooker. And either you're going to get stronger or you're going to combust and explode. And um, none of my siblings really function. Um, I shared that a little bit with you. Uh, my only brother killed himself when he was 21. He shot himself while he was drunk one night with a 270 in the head. Um, and I was called to help identify that body when I was 25. Um, that was hard. And, um, I quit drinking for a while, but I white knuckled it because I didn't have the tools that I needed. Um, all four of my sisters are convicted felons, all four of them. My, um, the last time I saw my older sister, Jen, and she was the one who had the head injury in the car accident, but, um, she was living in Price City, Utah, homeless. And they had actually called us the police there because she was squatting there. And when I walked in and, and it's hard because you just don't know what's real and what's not with her, but she made me prove that I was her sister. Um, and said that she didn't even recognize me. And when we took her from that house, I told her this, I said, I will buy you a house to live with. If you'll come to Casper, we'll get you on social security and we'll keep you sober and we'll help you. And she said, Deb, I have to protect your family from myself. And mm -hmm. um, that was true. Uh, um, her mind was gone. And so I took her to Walmart 
and I bought her a tent and a pair of shoes. And I dropped her off on the side of the road because that's what mm. she wanted me to do. Um, and then um, two months later, my mom died. So we called the Price City police officers, and it's a tiny mm-hmm. little town in Utah. And um, they said they went and found her for us because they knew where she was squatting and um, or in a tent or whatever with the homeless people. And um, she told them that my mother had been dead for years mm-hmm. and she didn't come to the funeral. So that's where her mind was. Um, my youngest sister just got out of five years of prison. I didn't tell you this, um, Victoria, but... Uh, and she went to prison because she stole $50,000 from my husband and I. Mm-hmm. Um, but here's the thing. Uh, and I actually didn't even prosecute her. It was my American Express card, my business card. And they prosecute. Um, but I do believe it saved her life. She's actually my one sibling. And she just finished a three-year stint in prison um, in Lusk, Wyoming. And she functions because they gave her a little bit of help there and she was sober for a while and she's the one I took to the pink concert and she has been sober for almost three years, four years. And I'm really proud of her. Um, so, I mean, she's, she's starting to function now, Um, but I have a a sister, you don't know this Victoria either. I fired her on Friday. My one sister who works for me, I had to fire. Um, Mm. she just can't function. And, you know, Mm -hmm. so none of them can. So that's what I grew up in. And so um, none of my siblings can even hold a job. So the the Maverick, as was your nickname, the strong, strong, (laughs) super strong one who looked out for everyone else, finally allowed herself to break and look at how you're putting yourself together. Look at this. Yeah. Finally breaking free of the yeah. messaging that you that you don't matter. That other people matter first. Yeah. All I'm of so those things. I'm so honored and so proud that I get to be a part of your journey. And I'm sure when David, Coach David and Terry and James and everyone on the AFL team hears this, they're going to echo what I say, but what a gift you are to us and what a gift you are to every listener. Um, You know, again, there is hope. There is hope while we have breath in our lungs. There is hope. Even for the Mavericks out there who think there's no way that they're allowed to crack. You can. So Deb, what would you say to someone who's listening and is wondering, mm-hmm. you know, don't I have to be the strong one? Don't I have to keep pushing mm-hmm. through? What would you say to them? No. I would say don't do it. I I would say there's a different way to be strong. And um, strength is measured in so many different areas. And so we tell ourselves that we're responsible for everybody else and that um, we we can keep it a secret or we don't tell anyone because they're not going to understand or no, there nobody will ever know what I went through, but I won't know what you did. And I honor all of it. Um, I would tell them that you're worth it. You're your biggest investment. Mm. You are your biggest investment. Yep. And finally, do you want to take a second and just give your kids and your hubby a little shout out? Yeah, I am truthfully one of the luckiest people and and coach victoria knows that um i've been surrounded in my life by the most amazing man who i almost mm-hmm. lost a few different times during the journey and probably rightfully so but um one day you know i work every day at trying to feel be deserving of him you know and that's the best that we can do um i i shared with coach victoria you know one of my my top fives in my life was when i met my oldest daughter 
when she was 19 and she's part of my life. She lives in Greeley, Colorado, and she's got a little baby that I just love. Um, And she calls me mom and her mom and dad are amazing. I couldn't have been so lucky. There have been people watching out for me. God, whoever, whether whether you believe in Allah or God or karma. Um, You know, I, um, I've been really, really blessed. And that's really what I see here are, um, I went through all those experiences and I made a lot of poor choices, but, um, somebody was watching out for me and now it's time for me to watch out for myself because I'm capable of it. But, um, yeah, I have, you know, I have really great kids and, and my husband, I'm just so lucky and I'm, my business is great and I'm supported and I just, I want to have, I'm very humbled first of all, that you would let me do this. I just want to tell you, thank you. Um, and I just hope that everyone can hear whatever they need to. And, um, you know, it's just my story and I just appreciate being able to tell it. I'm so glad that you did. Thank you. Thank you for, for trusting us and for, for allowing me to come into your life in such a way. All right. Deep breath, deep breath. Thank you, Deb. Uh, again, Deb Michael, uh, she is in Beyond 90. We'll have her back on the podcast when she hits one year alcohol free. So look forward to that. And guess what? If you book that discovery call and you uh, go through the process and are invited into P90, chances are you'll meet Deb and you'll get to share with her in your own words, what, what impact her story has had on you. So we hope to see you soon. And until next time, Deb and I wish you a great day and take good care of you. You're worth it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.